friends. Welcome to another episode of the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I'm East Forest. I'm coming to you today from Boulder, Utah, still down here in the beautiful landscape of the Grand Staircase, Escalante National Monument, and it's been just an amazing opportunity to be down here. <clears throat> Excuse me. In these COVIDian times, I couldn't think of a, a better place to be. As a matter of fact, I kind of feel like the the virus situation makes Boulder even better because there's hardly any tourists, obviously, and the roads are just locals, and there are few, very few planes flying overhead. So it almost has this vibe of like, you know, how it was or how, you know, how, how the earth is supposed to be in a sense. Today, we have a really great episode. I have Denise Kaufman. She's from a band called the Ace of Cups, which is pretty cool because they are an all-female rock group that started in the 1960s in the San Francisco psychedelic scene. From 1967 to 1972, they're right in the middle of all that 60s cultural and social revolution. And uh, they did, you know, free concerts in Golden Gate Park and all sorts of stuff in San Francisco. They shared stages with the band, The Grateful Dead. They opened for uh, Jimi Hendrix. And uh, that was at the Monterey Pop Festival. So pretty cool time. And they've stayed connected and they they kind of started making new music again in the last years. And so now they're like 50 years later still making rock music. So it's pretty badass. <laughs> so Denise, as far as I know, she's a guitar player and harmonica player in the band. But there's four women in the band. And we get into it. We get into the stories of what that was like, what it is like. Uh, music making, and I just feel really honored to be able to talk with them. I actually was introduced to the band a little bit back when we were recording uh, the saxophone for the Ram Dass album with Lorraine Weiss. And Lorraine had mentioned to me, hey, do you know about the Ace of Cups? And I have some friends in that band. You should chat with them. And it took a little bit for us to get connected, but I'm really glad we did. So thank you, Denise, for taking the time. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. I wanted to quickly let you know that I'm doing a live stream again on April 19th. This one's going to be a little different because I'm going to play basically the Ram Dass album live from my studio. And perhaps some of you out there, I haven't or I wasn't able to make it to your city or your country when I was doing my East Forest ceremony concerts, which I hope to do more of in person in the future at some point. But for now, we're doing this over the internet. And uh, love, serve, remember, the Ramdas retreat was supposed to be happening in Ojai at this time. And because it's not, they're switching it to a virtual retreat. And you can join that entire virtual two-day retreat for free. Uh, I put the links to join that retreat and to watch my particular performance. My performance is on April 19th, which is a Sunday at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. But the retreat is the 18th, Saturday, and Sunday. I think I'm the last thing of the retreat. So go over to eastforest.org and hit the tour page or something, and you'll see information about joining that entire retreat if you're interested, as well as checking out the live stream that I'll be doing. Um, There's lots of things going on over the weekend. It's Mirror by Star, archival footage and talks from Ram Dass, Govind Dass and Radha, Bruce Damer, excited about that. Our friend Raghu Marcus, uh, Krishna Das, myself, Rameshwar Das, Saraswati Anand. So lots of fun things. So you can check that out. And then it's also, I'm hoping, planning, you know how plans are these days, very much likely to change or, or hopefully not. Who knows? You got to be flexible. The May 2nd, I might be doing another East Forest ceremony style medicine music. Uh, also a live stream, of course. Uh, stay tuned for that. Best way to learn about that is to get in my email list, which you can do at eastforest.org. Or, you know, if you're into the whole social media thing, keep an eye out there. I'm sure we'll make a post about that and details about times and all that kind of jazz. And the Meditation for Cha- Chaotic Times was released on Spotify and Apple and all streaming platforms. And thank you so much for all the sharing that you've been doing of that and the messages you've been sending my way. You can reach me at team at eastforest.org. But it's, it's nice to know that 
or if that's helpful for you on that kind of platform, on the music streaming platforms, because it is a guided meditation. And I didn't know if that would bother some people who are just there to listen to music. Uh, let me know what you think about that. Should I release more guided meditations on the music streaming platforms such as Spotify and Apple Music? Or would you prefer that I just keep them here on the podcast? You can let me know at team at eastforest.org. Otherwise, I've just been here in Boulder and I've been walking the land and I've been in the studio recording piano tracks with my beloved Charles Walter upright piano. When I'm down here, I like to be able to get a chance to spend time with it. Um, but the Boulder Rock studio down here, yeah, that's where I mix the Ram Dass album. It's a pretty special place. But um, all in all, I think we're all kind of sinking into this experience that we're, we're having now. It's, what has it been? Four or five weeks? And again, none of us know, you know, how this is going to continue, how long, in what way, in what shape. But what I do know is that there's been great change. Something has died, and I feel this in myself where something new is emerging. And it's something that was always there, but it's something that I'm learning how to trust more and more. And my own compassion to recognize it for myself, I don't know... You know, I recognize that this is a an ongoing process. That I don't have like a destination that I'm arriving to, but I'm I'm sensing myself wanting and desiring to step more into the trust of the gift of life and the gift that really is how I started this whole East Forest experiment eleven years ago. You know, it started from a deep psychedelic experience and me wanting to share the music I had created for that with other people. It was deeply enmeshed in the spirit of the gift, and and that's how it all began. And I always wanted to keep that as the, the keel and the rudder of my ship as I moved forward with this project and not to lose, lose sight of that. And I've always found uh, ways or, or definitely tried to maintain ways to, to keep that energy throughout all the years. And no doubt there are times where that gets tricky or sticky or, or you, you lose your way a little bit, but I try to always keep, keep coming back to that. And recently, you know, with all this change, and I've also had change on the back end of East Forest with my uh, my management and I have uh, shifted, parted ways. Uh, we've had an amazing experience for several years, but we made a change. And through that, happening at the same time as COVID-19 and the whole world changing, it sort of exacerbated many other aspects of my uh, career and business changing, obviously not touring and that income shift, but, you know, checking in with other uh, team members that maybe I had been less in contact with or talking to new people about coming on board, basically reinventing what is East Forest. How do I interact with the world? And I'm not saying I figured that out, but what I what I am feeling is the kernel inside me, the seed that's always been there wanting to blossom again and into a new a new shape, a new form, saying, How can I step more into the gift? What does that mean? How does that look? How does that manifest in the creations that I make, but also how I interact with you? Uh, how I offer my offerings into the world. Now, look, it's still my job and my career, but I don't want just to be operating from the part of our brains that I think a lot of us felt initially in in the, the COVID quarantine times where it's sort of just like triage moments where we're just, oh my God, you know, I need food, I need toilet paper. How's, how's this going to work? How's that going to work? And some of those things are absolutely still in my head, but now I've had more time, especially coming down here to the land where there's a trust too of like, wait, I... What if I take the choice of of the belief that I am held and that I am being guided and that maybe what wants to emerge and what is emerging is is something I want even more? You know, maybe what is the gift in this process that is wanting to show itself to me that I need to clear away the noise or clear away the residue of that which is dead or rotten or in the way to say I need to make space to to till the garden in this time of spring that we're in so that something new can be born. And my job is to, to work that garden 
I can't always see how that seed is going to germinate, but it will. And I just need to watch and help it grow and do, that's like, I play a role in it. I don't feel like, again, I I don't feel I'm controlling those storms around me on the sea, but I want to point my ship. My hand is on that wheel and I'm picking a direction. So I don't have the answer for where that's all that's all going. I'm just sharing with you. That's the process that I'm kind of kind of been in lately, and uh, it feels good. It feels good. I still I still have that fear in here and that stuff swimming around. But there's there's been there's been something that feels sweet, and I uh, just wanted to speak to that. All right, let's get into this with no further ado. This is Denise Kaufman. Did she tell you about how all that came to be? No. Like kind of the synchronicities? Love, Can I tell love you? I'd to know. Yes, please. Uh, so I am friends with the woman who owns the house that she lives in in Santa Fe, outside Santa Fe. Ivy. Ivy, yes. Yeah, I know Ivy and Arthur. Yeah. I love I love yeah. both. Yeah. And uh Ivy a long time ago was like, you know, I have this place in outside Santa Fe and if you ever want to stay there, let me know. And there was a time we were going to Santa Fe, my partner Rada and I to go to Meow Wolf for her birthday and I thought we should see if we can stay there and see if she's home. She says I'm not going to be there, but uh let me check in with my saxophone shaman friend who lives there. And she did and said, yes, you guys can stay. And we did. And I show up and it was like late at night and Lorraine was uh, busy working and we kind of snuck in the guest house. And then the next morning I met her and we just vibed out and she's like, yeah, so we're both musicians. We're talking. And um, I went into the other third building that was there with all the sound healing stuff, which just like, you know, it's like a dream come true for me. And we're in there just kind of chatting and playing with music and I'm playing some little keyboard and she picks up her sax and she starts playing it against this little keyboard I'm playing. And it was just like, wow, this mm. is this mm. is special. And I said, mm. we've got to record. We've got to record. And I said, maybe I can come back or something. I'll bring some equipment. And we kind of just left it at that. And then the Ramdas project, I was producing that over the year and she hit me up and she says, you know, I got invited to a wedding in Zion, which as far as Southern Utah is concerned, even though that's four hours away, that's very close. Right. And I thought, damn, we, this is, all right, we got, you got to come by to the studio. And she says, I don't drive. I have no way to get there. Two more days later, she says, I found someone who's willing to drive me all the way there, stay there while we record and then drive me up to Salt Lake to the airport. And so all these things were falling into place. And she came and we gave her a place to stay and we came down to the studio and I said, okay, like, let's just, let's just, 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 let's just make noise. You know, here I had some tracks for her and we started recording and recording. We just did one day of multiple th- songs and several of them were ones like the song that became, it's called a miracle, which is just Ram Dass telling the story of meeting Maharaji for the first time. And it's just a long ambient piece with Lorraine playing in the background that was one we just did on the spot. Just real quickly, I made some drones and we did it together live. So a lot of things came into the sh- into shape in the moment. And uh, after she left, you know, it's she she you know her saxophone it, it's imbued with a kind of uh, spirit and tone and femininity, femininity and soul, uh, and yeah. it's a uniqueness you don't hear it on a lot of records. And yes. it ends the whole record. Yes. Is that song Love Everyone with Ram Dass, uh, the piano, and Lorraine Sax. And I really like having like a female yeah. musicians on the record and having a female elder and someone who's like doing some really amazing work in the world. So Lorraine was on my podcast. I had to really twist her arm. After we finished recording, we're in the studio. I just put up my mic. <laughs> like, we're doing this. She's like, I don't want to do it. I was like, we're doing it. And it was such a great episode. So. Uh. You guys are friends. Thank you for for joining us on this podcast. Um, uh, It's 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 great to talk, and I want to get into what you're up to, and and your friendship with Lorraine is be great to hear about too. But just just want to say thank you for taking the time. It's perfect. We've we've talked about this for a while. I mean, we or we've emailed about this for a while. Yeah. Um, But it took uh, 
COVID to kind of clear the calendar for both of us that we <laughs> right. be on too. So there are silver linings and um, hopefully hopefully we'll get through this time and, and um, with as little, you know, as little grief as possible. Yeah, yeah, you were just saying before we started that you're going through some floods there as well. I was yeah. out on Kauai a couple years ago. I hiked the Kau Lao Trail and camped out there for a while, which is a incredibly beautiful but incredibly dangerous trail. I mean, it was, yeah, it was it really terrifying at yeah. times. And I heard that a few weeks after or months after I was there, this is a couple years ago, there was another giant flood and the whole thing was just wiped out. Lots of homes were wiped out. And so you're saying you're having more now. Yeah, more that, that was uh, April, um, I think 2018 was that, right. what, those big floods. Yeah. And the floods that we had this week um, were, they were somewhat in Hanalei. And actually to tell the truth, because I've been, um, we've all been self-quarantining here um, because I flew in about two weeks ago. So I didn't, I haven't gone out oh. to see anyone. Um, and neither is my, my family. We've all been just at home. Um, right. Uh, so now or just today is two weeks. So today we, you know, we could actually um, go to a store, but, um, but there's also a quarantine on, I mean, a, a curfew on the Island and a request to not be on the roads unless absolutely necessary because we have a small healthcare system here. Mm -hmm. And it, the less people that are on the roads, the less chance there is for some kind of accident. And oh, that would be a demand on the first responders or on the healthcare system that we don't want. We want to keep all the energy available for COVID, which we have, we have uh, 12, we've had 12 cases, I think, thus far on the island. Mm -hmm. But um, they've all been either tourists who are now gone or residents who were on the mainland and came here and... There have been no hospitalizations. They've all been, uh, you know, shelter at home and recover. So we're really trying to keep... Yeah, it'd be great if, as an island, you guys could kind of have your own extinguishing of the virus yes, exactly. sooner than everybody else. Yeah, well, we've had no, thus far, no community spread. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're just, I mean, everyone's really pretty much being super cooperative to try and... Good. Not... Uh, um, you know, not have it, it go downhill here. So, right. Yeah, we, we think we have like something like 12 ventilators on the island. We just could not handle if we have two hospitals, really. Yeah, and, you've, you, it's, you have no choice. You've got to keep it under control. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and you know, there's in the culture here, there's such love and respect for the elders. For it's in here, it's, you know, the kapuna, the kapuna. Mm -hmm. um, so the, you know, there's really a sense of, that's cultural here between you know, the Hawaiians and the Japanese culture and the Chinese culture, all the people who have come here, the Filipino culture, you know, that mm -hmm. the elders are are still revered and um, protected. So that's an And have you, have you lived there? Has this been your home for a while? Um, it was my home for 11 years straight. And then I went to L.A. to go to music school. And since those days, I've been go, sort of going back and forth between our little family farm here uh, in uh, Kilauea, uh, which is on the North Shore, and um, living in the uh, in California. My daughter so, and son-in-law, and my, we, my grandson was raised here. So um, we have a little family farm, and my family oh, wow. has, a, has a music store and a little performance venue in Hanalei, which is now closed because of the what's going on and we're hoping that it will survive as well we're hoping a lot of small businesses here will survive this yeah i um, know for me it's like everything is stopped except yeah. for the things that are like this yes. or that i can do by myself in the studio as far as performing and right. i imagine you guys had some because i know you were in the studio i'm assuming that's why you're on the mainland and and you had to come back and uh i was just thinking for myself like if i if i was in a band and that's how I was making music. That would be a big drag because that's the one thing I can't do is gather as as a group. Right. Right. So that's, yeah, has that been we, tough? We just finished our next album two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So that's when I left and came here the, Under the, wire. the next day. Um, mm -hmm. So because our band, everybody, li ew, everybody lives in different places. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so the our central gathering place for Ace of Cups is in Marin County in, in uh, uh, Novato. And then we record in San Rafael at Laughing Tiger Studio. So our producer lives there. Our recording studio that where we record is there. And our drummer and a keyboard player live in that area. And then the other three of us, two live in Hawaii and one lives up in Northern California near the Oregon border, Weaverville. Mm. So we have a gathering place, which is Marin. Um, and we did have gigs that were scheduled. Um, not too many are until the real kind of summer tour starts in, toward the end of June. Mm-hmm. And at this point, not that hasn't been canceled. Lock in. Lock and Festival hasn't been mm-hmm. canceled. And we have a we're playing at Fur Peace Ranch, which is Yarma Kalkinen uh, and Vanessa, his wife from the from the uh, Jefferson Airplane and Hot Tuna. He has his beautiful, they have a beautiful camp, music camp and music venue called Fur Peace, F-U-R-P-E-A-C-E, Fur yeah. Peace Ranch. So um so we'll thus see. far it's not yeah. canceled, but you know, who knows? Okay. Well, let's let's take a couple people back. Just give them some uh, some basic background and history, so they know what we're talking about here. Uh, take us back to Ace of Cups, late '60s, and give people a little background on w- where you guys are at in this music scene. Obviously, how time passed and where we are now, and then I'll pick it up from there. Okay. So, actually, I'll start in the um, mid '60s. Um, I grew up in San Francisco and uh, went to Berkeley in the fall of 1964. Um, went to UC Berkeley, graduated in this June of 1964, and um, that that fall was the free speech movement, and mm-hmm. I I was basically a very political person. And that's why I went to Berkeley and got immediately involved in the free speech movement and got arrested there. And uh, it was a pretty radicalizing experience for a a little girl from San Francisco um, just to be beaten up by the police and taken to Oakland jail and um, just the whole experience. That was the fall of 64, was a fall of, of political organizing and protest and, and, um, and inspiration in terms of being part of the FSM. Um, the spring of that year, um, I got turned on to LSD, and um, that was a real spiritual opening for me, something I've actually been kind of exploring anyway for years through yoga and other things. How, I've been how old were you at, at that first journey with LSD? I just turned 18 a couple okay. months, a few months before. Okay. Right. But um, I'd been had a yoga teacher from like uh, actually a bhakti yoga teacher in San Francisco, but from the time I was 15 and I was always exploring other, other modalities um, Mm -hmm. um, of opening spirit. And um, so LSD was huge for me. Um, So that was in the spring and I started taking, taking it pretty regularly. And um, I was also, playing in, not in a band. I wasn't the main, a member of the band, but I played with some guys who had a band in Berkeley. Yeah, they were, um, they were called The Answer. They were all in, still in high school. They were great players. And um, I played with mm-hmm. them some and, um, and we took some acid together a few times. And we ended up uh, going to a conference that our guitar player's dad was the uh, organizer of. He was the head of the Star King Theological School for the Unitarian Ministry, uh, which is the National School School for U- Training Unitarian Ministers. It's in Berkeley, and his, uh, Dr. Samuel Wright was the head of school, and um, his son was in this band. So he invited Dr. Wright invited us to come down to a conference that uh, was their kind of annual conference of all the Unitarian ministers, and it came from all over the country. And we drove down to Monterey, California, which is where the conference was. And there was, as we drove on the conference ground, there was this multicolored bus on the conference ground, which Uh-oh. we we'd never seen anything like that before. And we drove Don't up get on to the it, bus, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it was some people who said they were the pranksters, and we're like, "What's that?" Oh boy, yep. <laughs> so this was now June of '65, 
And um, turned out that the keynote speaker of that conference was Ken Casey. And um, so we spent the weekend there. I met Casey that first night, spent the night on the beach with him. Um, and um, the next week he came up to my apartment in Berkeley where I was starting my sophomore year with summer school. And he just said, get your stuff. You're coming to La Honda. You're going to, you're, you know, you're going to be on the bus with us. <laughs> wow. And so I did. Um, so that was my next year of life. We, you know, had the band, you know, the Grateful Dead was our band and we traveled around doing the, um, the acid tests and the trips festival in San Francisco. And, um, and then the bus Casey got busted. Casey and Mountain Girl got busted uh, on the roof of uh, Stuart Brand's house just before the Trips Festival. And um, that was their second bust. And so Casey was facing a you know, pot bus. It was facing, you know, significant jail time at that point. And uh, so he staged a prank, a fake suicide and, and went to Mexico. And some week, you know, a couple of months later, I guess it was, the bus followed him. And uh, I stayed in San Francisco because I wanted to play music. I, I didn't want to go to Mexico at that point. And um, mm -hmm. so I, I joined a band, which later became Moby Grape. The guys in that band were uh, from Seattle and we, we played for some months, but it wasn't really the band for me. And I went back to San Francisco. We had been down the peninsula and, uh, and um, it was New Year's Eve from, 1966 turning into 1967 and I went to a New Year's Eve party at the band Blue Cheers house and I walked into a, an empty bedroom upstairs and there was a woman with straight blonde hair sitting on a bed playing blues on acoustic guitar and I pulled out my harmonica that I always carry and started playing with her and we just had this rocking jam and when it was over, she said, you know, I'm I'm getting together with some other women and we're we're starting an all women's band. You should come and meet us, you know. There and, it is. And yeah, that was it. And uh, you know, my first reaction was all women. That is the weirdest thing I ever heard, you know, because <laughs> I really had never played with women before. I didn't know any women who were playing like that. You know, I mean, I knew some classical right. players and things like that, but I didn't know any, any women personally. I mean, obviously I knew who Buffy St. Marie was and, you know, people like that, but I didn't, I hadn't played with any women who were rocking mm -hmm. for sure. Um, so I went over and met them and uh, we just started playing and writing from the get-go. So that was in January of 67. And within a few weeks, we had a manager and we had, you know, some real support. And by that June, well, by that April, we moved into a house that our manager and his, his friend helped us get kind of quit our day jobs and move into a house in Marin County and practice all the time and write. And then by that June, we opened for Jimi Hendrix in Golden Gate Park on the Panhandle. <laughs> so it all happened. How many, how many quickly. people were at that show in Golden Gate Park? You know, it was um, it was in the Panhandle. It wasn't like in Speedway Meadows, which was this giant, you yeah. know, meadow. But um, you know, I want to say maybe a thousand, maybe two. It wasn't, you know, what maybe. So, had you guys played a lot of shows before that? Uh, we had just gone out of town and played a few out, you know, outlying gigs, and I, I think we played, you know, not very many. Not were you nervous? Because we did, did, <laughs> or were you, you guys know, just kind of? I don't remember being nervous. I was, you know, <laughs> the rest of the band uh, had gone the early, the weekend before to the Monterey Pop Festival um, because uh, our friends, the Electric Flag, who had put their band together, they'd used our house for their rehearsal studio when they put that band together. So they were making their debut at Monterey Pops, and they invited our band to go down for the weekend and here you know here go to the festival Every, i think our drummer didn't go but everybody else in the band went except for me i was starting on that monday to study his sitar with nikhil Banerjee um in san Fran in uh, in berkeley and mm -hmm. um who was you know that's this was sort of the precursor of what turned into the ali akbar college but this was the american society for eastern arts program and um i had enrolled in studying every day with Mr. Banerjee. Um, 
So I thought when those the band went away for the weekend, I thought I'll just spend the weekend, I'll meditate, I'll do yoga, I'll be in the spirit of starting my sitar course. So I didn't go to the Monterey Pop Festival. But when my bandmates came back, you know, I said to our lead guitar player, so, you know, well, so what was it like? And, it, and she just looked at me and she went, Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> like, Who's that? So that totally. was his, you know, that was his American debut. Um, mm. um with his band. So that had only happened a week before we played with him. And so he wasn't as well known. I mean, now when you say, well, we opened for Jimi Hendrix in Golden Gate Park, this is like before the internet, right? People didn't, mm -hmm. you know, so if you were at Monterey or you, you know, you knew about it, but it, a week later, it wasn't, he wasn't as well known as he would be shortly after. So, so okay, that's sort so of a long answer to why there weren't 20,000 people in the park that day or 50. Sure, that's still cool. Yeah. I was just curious. Um, yeah. So you guys were in the thick of the scene for a little while, and obviously something occurred because there was essentially this 50-year break until now. And uh, so there's two things that I want to ask you about. One is there's sort of an endurance, uh, an enduring quality to the relationship you have to each other that, in essence, the band it was on hi hiatus, maybe without you even knowing it, as opposed to just flat out breaking up. And also, I wonder what role you think being an all-female band maybe played in whatever occurred in in the timeline that you see that it didn't break the way you thought it could have broken, or why it might have not at that time. Well, you, you know, when you said something occurred, I would say more more that something didn't occur in those mm -hmm. days, which was we didn't get a record deal. Uh -huh. um, in those days, which was, you know, the beginning of FM radio, but more AM radio, um, if you didn't have a record deal, you really didn't tour in a larger sense. And yeah. nobody knew who you were outside of your hometown area, you know? Right, right. And um, most of the bands that we were, that were our contemporaries were getting record deals um, and going going out on tour and um, you know making a name for themselves in a larger sense, sure. um, but we didn't get that chance, and because of that, it just kind of it kept us at a certain level um, um, financially. We couldn't afford to just keep going, and we were ha having children. We had by the end of the band, we had three. Um, well, actually, at the very by the end of the band, we um, four of us had had children. What what year was? Would you say was the end of the band? In that well, era? the end of the band, sort of really, you'd say seventy two, but it was really before that, um, maybe seventy one. So you guys um, were going for four years. Yeah, doing the music, okay, a lot. I mean, we yeah, we have a really wonderful archivist, Corey Arnold, who who has put together all of the gigs that we played, and it's so many. You know, when I when our manager first saw his list, she, he goes, that's not possible. <laughs> it really was. We, those were all the gigs. We played a lot. And, um, cool. and it was great. Um, but yeah, you know, especially when you have children that, you know, the, the, the guys in our band, in our contemporary bands, the brother bands were, were having children too, but they had wives who or girlfriends who stayed home with the children when they toured, right. but we didn't right. have, you know, we couldn't do that. We were nursing mothers for the most part. So we would have had to take in, you know, nannies with us on the road, which we did a little, you know, I mean, we had people that helped us with the children so we could rehearse and play local gigs, but um, it would have, we, we would have had to get to another financial level to pull all that off. And yeah. There's an inequality didn't. there. I mean, how do you feel, how do you feel about that? Or how did you feel about it then? This idea of just like inherently, being women, especially in the late sixties, early seventies, um, I maybe I would say this is still the case. You know, I mean, we think about musicians now, where like when this when the social order or the financial order breaks down, there's no real safety net for us. It's like, and there never has been, and there isn't now. It's sort of like, yeah, I can think of female musicians that I know, especially ones that are um, in a solo project, and they just have to figure it out. You right. know, whereas a male has certain advantages because they're like, well, I might not have a child that I have to care for right now. Right, right. Systemic, yeah. That must have been kind of frustrating in it, a way. It, it was. I think, you know, the fact that 
with us, there were five of us and we all sang and we all wrote. So we didn't have one lead singer mm -hmm. and we all had different musical backgrounds. So the styles, you know, we, we never felt like there was any direction we couldn't go in musically from, you know, some things that Mary Gannon did that were kind of uh, almost humorous. She kind of had a, a, a theater background. So there was that. There was Marla with her gospel background. There was, you know, Mary Ellen with a kind of folk bluesy background. I mean, we all had, so our music had many facets. And, um, and then because the sort of focus of attention would go from one person to another, the, you know, Keyboard players lead singing, the guitar players lead singing, the bass players lead singing, all of that, you know, and most bands in those days had one or two lead singers. Um, and then we had a lot of harmonies. Uh, we were really a harmony-based band. So I think, you know, when right, the record label people looked at us, they couldn't quite figure out you know, what we were, right. you know, style-wise. And, you know, we didn't, it was just, I think we were sort of out of the box, which we still are. Um, that's that's I'm yeah. sure an advantage now, maybe more than it was then. But it, yeah, what what is what's different now, and what's the maybe the same? You know, after all all the years. So first of all, you sort of asked about the 50 year hiatus. Yeah, um, which was um, all through the years because we did almost almost all of our music was our original music. Mm -hmm. um, we particularly loved to get together when we could in twos or threes or fours or sometimes even five of us to play our own music because really nobody else knew it, right? Mm -hmm. So there were a whole, there's a body of music that we loved that we could only play with together. Mm -hmm. um, at least if we wanted to hear the harmony parts you wanted to hear, you know, it's like you could sing it by yourself, but it was missing something. So um when we'd get together through the years, it didn't happen too often because really nobody could afford it. We all lived in different places and some of us were raising children and we couldn't afford to all come together as much as we probably would have loved to. But when we could, we did. And um, and then through those years, everybody kept playing music. So some of us were in different bands through the years. Others, um, Mary Gannon became a um, music teacher in Kauai here. Um, I got together with some friends of mine from her and we started a school and later Mary Gannon was the music teacher at that school. And then yeah. so when she retired, her daughter was the music teacher at that school. <laughs> um, and, um, the, and like Mary Ellen became a mental health caseworker up in Northern California, way Northern California, but she was always in bands, either blues bands or country bands through those years. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Diane, our drummer never stopped playing, was in, in multitudes of bands. And she's a great singer and a great drummer. But you guys um, kept a connection. As so a group, we did, you know, we like. kept con for both each, each individually with music and then with mm -hmm. each other when we could. Um, but in 2003, an English record label called um, Big Beat Music, which is a division of Ace Records in, in the UK, um, they had reached out to us, a fellow named Alec Palau, um, who was this amazing archivist of um, and, and archaeologist for great music of the Bay Area, particularly, but American music in general of that era. He reached out to us about to see if we had any archival tapes. And we did have this couple of boxes of reel to reel tapes that were basically rehearsal tapes or tapes made at a live gig by our road manager just so we could listen to them and improve. And then there were a few that were done in yeah, a couple of other situations. And so they asked if we had tapes. And we said, well, yeah, we do. You know, they've been in a garage, gone through a hurricane, but we don't know what mm -hmm. condition they're in, but we have these tapes. They sound gritty, probably. It's right. good. <laughs> so the, the Alec Palau went through all those tapes. And out of that was the first release of the Ace of Cups music, which was just from these live tapes called from, you know, what sounded the best. Um, it wasn't even necessarily the songs we would have chose to put on an album, but they were the only ones we had. It's what you had. And um, that album came out in 2003 or four. It's called It's Bad For You But Buy It, which is a line from one of our songs. And um, 
that was the first time that people who had heard about us or read our name on a you know 60s psychedelic poster mm. had really heard anything of ours mm. um other than a couple of things that had been bootlegged. Is, is that on is that on streaming platforms? Yeah, now, it that is. particular album. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And so one of the people who heard that record was a fellow out of New York named George Bear Wallace, who is, you know, late 49 years old now. Um, and so he wasn't around in the 60s, but he has a huge passion for the music of the Bay Area uh, and California. And nationally, too, but the music of that era. And he had started a record label called High Moon Records that was dedicated, like a boutique label dedicated to finding these treasures that had either been released and had gone out of print or never released. And he approached us in 2010 and, you know, said, do you have any archival material? And we said, well, I... Not really. I mean, Ace Records went through, you know. That was it. Think of that. We think that was it. <laughs> I mean, there are some other tapes around. But anyway, we, but we began a relationship with George. And in 2011, we got invited to play for Wavy Gravy's 75th birthday in San Francisco. Uh, well, actually, in, it was in um, the East Bay at the Craneway Pavilion with, you know, some of the longtime fans of Camp when it rainbow that and must have been foundation. really exciting to yeah get, it was yeah, great but, I mean, you know we a, played a few gigs yeah. through the years but none mm. as big as that mm. and we just went for it and George, we, and because of george he said if you want to play that gig i'll rent you a house and i'll rent you a rehearsal studio for you know a couple of weeks and you can come together and you can play that gig so we did and um out of that, George, uh, it was, you know, obviously it was the first time he met everybody in the band except me. I'd already met him, but he also heard us play live and he was enamored. You know, he, he was inspired. And he, after that, the three of us, um, our guitar player, Mary Ellen, and our drummer, Diane, and myself felt like we wanted to keep playing together. And George helped us make that possible. So for the next cool. couple of years... We'd come together, we up from our separate places we lived and, you know, rent a rehearsal studio and write and play for, you know, four or five days, every couple of months. And we started writing a bunch of new material and we'd send it to George, you know, with our iPhone, <laughs> just like, mm -hmm. listen to this song, you know. And after about two and a half, three years of that, he just started saying, you guys have to go into a studio. And his album, I mean, his record label had only done archival material, so he hadn't you know, produced an album or executive produced an album because that was, wasn't what their mandate of their label was. But he, because we didn't have, we never had been in the studio to make that album that he could re-release. He didn't, we didn't have it. So he said, you never got the chance. You need to get the chance to do this. So, so, we went, so great. I know he was amazing. So we went in the studio and we started recording. We found our amazing producer, Dan Shea, through Diane. Diane knew him. He, he grew up in Marin County, but then had moved to L.A. and, and produced or been on, and, you know, co-produced or been part of the albums of a lot of people whose names you know. He, you know, really had a beautiful career um, with, you know, Mariah Carey and, uh, you know, J-Lo J, J and all, you know, every all kinds of people played on, yeah. you know. So he... Um, but he was from Marin County and he grew up, you know, basically up on Mount Tamalpais. And um, Evelyn Cipollina was his p piano teacher, um, who was um, John Cipollina's mother, who was the lead guitar player in Quicksilver. So we all had a lot of synergy and overlapping connection. Even though Dan was younger, he, he was at gigs that we played. Um, yeah, so he doesn't remember us. <laughs> he was a little boy. <laughs> but... Um, so he became our producer and um, he really took us through the process because, you know, as a band, we didn't have much, you know, when we recorded background vocals for bands in the 60s, which we did for the Airplane or Mike Bloomfield or Quicksilver, we would stand around one microphone and sing background vocals. That's the way vocals. it was done. You could yeah. still do that. <laughs> right. But, you know, yeah. we hadn't been doing our songs and we hadn't been recording mm -hmm. our instruments and all that. So... Dan Shea, you know, took us through this process. And we started thinking we were going to record 12 songs. Dan got all immersed in all of our music, all the archival tapes that we had. And then we were sending him, you know, songs that we'd written in the intervening years. And we started out with 12 songs. And then we would 
send, we say to George, send, you know, okay, George, we have to choose between simplicity or, um, um, you know, uh, dressed in black. And he'd say, you can't, you have to do both of those. You have to, you know, and then it, so it went from 12 to 16 to 25 to we recorded 36 songs. Killer. And um, we released a double album about a year, about 15 months ago, our, our first studio album, our debut album, uh, you know, studio material. And now we're finishing the second one, which is some new songs that we've recorded in the last few months and some that were part of the original group that we were recording a couple of years ago. And then we'll have a third one out in a year. So are there any other like all female bands that you've had camaraderie with like Slater Kinney or I know labels like even Kill Rock Stars and Portia Sabin and stuff You know, we haven't really met um, some of those younger women. I mean, the, I'm in touch with the, the June Millington from Fanny. Mm-hmm. Fanny was the kind of the in the Bay Area. They came just a little behind us, you, you know, in terms of their um, notoriety, right. um, and um, and they were based, I think, originally in Stockton and then in, in San Jose. Um, great band, um, and they did get signed. They were kind of the first band of women that we had ever heard of who got a record deal. And they were just a couple of years behind us and, and all that. But I think we were just a little too early and a little too hippie. And you know. <laughs> <laughs> now you can't be hippie enough. Yeah, it's like bring the hippie on. Right. Um, when you're recording, um, I guess that was like 10 years ago or whenever you started doing it in earnest in this later that was session. I think for, uh, let's see. Let's see. The album came out in 2019 and we recorded from 2015. Was there anything about it that was bittersweet? Like now you're coming from whole different perspectives in your lives when you're writing music than it, also the era in which you're writing it. Like how, how does it feel different now to be writing to the times that we're in, but coming from a band that you started in the 60s, which is a different time period. But at the same time, you know, that was the beginning of the sort of age of Aquarius, which you could argue we're still in it. If anything, like what's happening right now, the coronavirus is just in another acute manifestation yes. of the same larger wave yes uh, of change so how does it how does that writing process feel now for you guys well um there's something we fall into that is just familiar in mm-hmm. terms of when we work up harmonies and things like that we just you know there's something that's you know no we just know each other in that way mm-hmm. and um there's something timeless about it and um there's, it's not bittersweet. It's just sweet and amazing. I love that. Um, there's, you know, and I, I think about it that in the 60s, not in the San Francisco scene that we were in, I think we had so much support from other bands, the guys, our managers. I mean, we had so much support from, from men in our lives um, and still do with George and, and Dan Shea and people like that. But, but, I think the larger record world and stuff, you know, they looked at us like, what were we? We were, you know, these hippie chicks that, you know, played barefoot and, you know, it's like, you know, we did not fit into what the record pl- companies were really looking for at that point. Um, I think now, so we didn't experience much sexism. I mean, at, sure, at moments and culturally, there were definitely some things that, in roles of women, even hippie women, that when you look back, you go, well, you know, like, you didn't really wash that many dishes, you know. What I mean, we did, um, but whatever, whatever it was. I, now, the thing that I think that we're um, we're facing, and I can give you some examples of it, is um, is ageism, and I think that's what women these days face. I mean, there's a, you know, not to say that women in music aren't up against a lot of, um, you know, of, of misogyny because it's in the culture. And, you know, just the notion of, say, what rock music is or, you know, if you want to go to a genre, you know, rock music as defined by men, you know, there's a, you can, there's, there's ways to rock that are maybe more um, uh, like inerrant to some women, or at least oh, maybe a lot of women, that they're still rocking, but it's got a different flavor and a different um, um, 
uh, kind of accent or, or a different focus. Or depth in a way. Maybe it's sort of the masculine definition of rocking out exactly. versus the feminine. It's like you exactly. can embody that masculine rock out, but then there's this whole, all these other layers and colors of right. what is rocking out. And, you know, I think, <laughs> you know, awesome. um, sure, there are women who are incredible shredders on guitar, but, you know, there are, you know, for for us at least, that was really balanced out by harmony, and mm. and um, you know it's got a different flavor, mm. and so you know and still the, uh, people I know we've done you know interviews with uh, on radio stations and stuff where women have have DJs have you know have just said yeah there was all these rules that you could only have one woman an hour on your program on your programming. No way. You know, they were they were like totally, you know, and uh, now it's know. the opposite. I feel like it's like you can only have one white male, you know. <laughs> I, I have two males. That's that's my problem is like I I I want to find more women and 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 people of color on my podcast and I'm act I always actively am seeking that out as a way of trying to keep balance. And, th- and that can be a criticism I guess. Like wow, a lot of guys, a lot of guys. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I know. I know. There's a lot of Yeah, I think there may be some of that, and, you know. And that and that you know, it's sort of affirmative action, isn't it? You know, mm-hmm. yes. like it's well, and, and keeping diversity and the voices out there. Right. So you, you can right. get in your own silo of right. um, myself being a guy and a white guy. It's sort of like, I guess those are a lot of my friends. And so I yeah. need to do my own work to diversify what I'm, what I know and what I reach out to. Yes. So, yeah, there's, you know, but there's, there's a bit to make up for. And yeah, there. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah. say, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and so, for us now, um, now given that there are so many amazing women playing music, and you know that that daughters and granddaughters are out there with their bands, and you know, you know, like most, you know, twelve-year-old girls have <laughs> at least many of them have their own bands already, you know. And, mm-hmm. you know, so my, my friends, the band Raining Jane, they have a girls rock camp that they run every year in Los Angeles. And there are those all over the place. And, you know, so Fine. there are so there's a lot of nourishment for girls to write and play and step out. What there isn't is a lot of support for women, older, older women in, you know, in music, certainly, but also in every other field. You know, actors get sidelined and... um you know, it's somewhat starting to change, I think. In, maybe, I don't know how much it is in, in film, but in, um, I know even in art, it, there are, you know, women artists whose paintings are finally being shown. They've been painting for 80 years, you know, uh, mm. or they're 80-year-old no, right. artists, you know, and it finally, and poets whose, you know, or writers whose books were kind of overlooked in their, you know, the era when you would have thought they would have gotten a chance, but now their poetry is out there. So I think For that's sure. starting to happen. But, you know, in the music world that we're in, um, it's rare. And um, we face, like, we had an interesting ha- thing happen, if you want an example. So sure. our album came out in 2019, and we submitted for the Grammys uh, for that Grammy cycle. Mm -hmm. And one of the categories we submitted in was best new artist because the category of new artists had the qualification that you had to um, have made the album within a certain or released the album within a certain date time frame, which we did. And that it had to be um, that you had to have not had a great, basically, notoriety or fame before that, um, which we didn't. I mean, we never toured. We never had an album. We never, you know, we didn't have, you know. And Mm -hmm. um, um, there was one more qualification. I can't remember what it was. But we fit in all of the qualifications for this, to submit for this category. And when we did an interview with Billboard and we you know, they they knew her, knew we had submitted. They said, "Wouldn't it be?" And their headline on the article on us was something like, "You know, you know, best new artists." You know, so question right? It was something about story. the best new yeah. artists. You know, so it was like it was a really fun thing to contemplate that we could at least be in the running for that because we never got to do it. We never got to make an album before, right? right. Um, and so we got a letter back from the Grammy committee 
saying, we have eliminated you from that category because <laughs> you had notoriety 50 years ago. You did? <laughs> no, we did not. Yeah, we didn't have like a record. And us. I wrote back to them and I just yeah. said, excuse me, we didn't have a record. We didn't tour. Nobody knows who we were. I mean, nobody outside of who saw us, you know, and then you can look at all the people that were uh, allowed to be in that category who had albums out before. I mean, they had, you know, they're very, they bend the rules when they want to, right? Mm. And so we said, yeah, that's completely untrue. And then they wrote back and said, well, how would it look if we said, and the winner of Best New Artist for two, 2020 is a band that existed 50 years ago. What, I think it's a great story. It looked right. amazing for them. That's uh, yeah. We wrote back and said, are you really asking that question? Like, you don't do you need think us that to hit it inspiring? over your head? Yeah, that's good. That's good PR. That's how yeah. they, elim so they eliminated us. But I mean, we weren't really, we were, did not have any whole, you know, think that we were going to win over Billie Eilish or, or, you know, Lizzo or whoever. But we and we, we were eliminated from the first phase of it, which was being in the category with yeah, the thousand yeah, I, other people. I'm familiar, right. You know, and so it was like, that was direct ageism, you know. And pointless, because like you said, to be in like, there just to be voted on, it's like, why yeah, not? Like, yeah. Let the public decide. It's very political, exactly. the Grammy yeah. stuff. So they we were, did, and they were, you know, they were, you know, so, yeah. So we have been um you know it's been interesting to to be playing now and and we're doing our best to kind of you know throw some mud in the face of that ageism and and uh and just so and you know that whatever that that attitude um is to kind of you know explode some of those stereotypes um so as grandmothers to do that uh four of us are are well Four, four of us are mothers, three are grandmothers, one didn't have children. Yeah. Rock and grandmothers. It's a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I know there's, uh, when you're playing music when you're 18 or 20, especially rock music, there's that kind of hunger and the drive that kind of feeds you when you want to say, okay, we got to hit the road and all the hardships that go along with touring. No matter how plush your, your touring is, it's tough. You know, yes. I know that firsthand. Um, and so it's got to be different now, but you obviously still have a hunger. But what what is the drive now that you feel that's making you want to do this now? What's the well, thing we, that, that drives? We love it all? playing our music. Mm -hmm. We love playing. We love playing our music. We love connecting with people who connect with it. It's mm -hmm. just touching people's hearts, you know. And we love. Um, singing about what we're singing about. And that kind of goes back to your question about, was it bittersweet or, you know, what were we singing about in the sixties? We're singing about the same things we were singing about then, mm -hmm. you know, our songs are, are, um, um, about our vision for this world. And, you know, and there's some of them are sassy and some of them are, you know, relationships gone wrong or relationships, but they're all about kind of, even those are, are about women, empowering women in those situations, you know, and claiming some power. And, um, but a lot of our songs are really about um, the oneness that we all are and, and um, living that way and, and, and what really matters. And so we want to sing about those things. We write about them. We want to sing about what matters to our in our hearts and I you know music is our you know very primary way to communicate as as a band and and we think our songs are more relevant now you know and people I, I are looking see that yeah you know people are looking for um I mean, we've had a lot of people that reach out to us uh, online even uh, as well as at you know at shows and just but people will write to us from all over the world and just say I knew there were women playing in those days, but we just didn't, we didn't know what they were singing about. We didn't know what this music was about. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, you know, that we knew there had to be women playing. Um, and, you know, it's like, it's what you were talking about at reaching out for diversity. It's like, who are the voices defining, def defining a time or expressing a time? And if they're only a, a certain group and some are marginalized, you want to hear who are those people? 
Yeah, you know, and who, who are the, the gatekeepers who are deciding? Who, yes. Like you said, if you didn't get the record deal, then it that was voice them. isn't heard. It's like other people are making that decision. It's yeah, not just, exactly. It's not really just the public. Right. Always. And that's what's amazing about now is with the internet, you know, is that, you know, you can put up some music and you can share some music. And if you, you know, I know there's a huge amount of it, but if it resonates with some people, you can actually touch the hearts that, you know, or, or, yeah. you know, my yeah. whole career is about it. I, I always have to do things my own way because right. I'm doing things that are a little different and it's all about just even things like this conversation. It's like, we just do it and you, you send it out to the people who you're building your own community. Yes. And it's beautiful that way. Yes. Really. Yeah. It's my grandson. All my family are all musicians. My ex-husband's a wonderful jazz player in the Bay area. Noel Jukes, mm -hmm. dear friend of Lorraine's. Um, mm -hmm. um, and um, my daughter and son-in-law, um, she's a beautiful jazz singer, Tora, and um, her husband's a wonderful guitarist. And they have a music store and little performance venue here in Kauai, which is closed right now, but it's called Hanalei Strings. And um, they're they're just starting to put out, you know, um, inter uh, online music and things like that because everything's closed. So, mm -hmm. but we've, and then my grandson um, is... Eli Smart, who had, we just brought him home from England where he's been in music school in Liverpool, just about to graduate this year. He goes to the school that was founded by Paul McCartney, the LIPA, Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts. And he's a wonderful songwriter, guitarist, but he plays everything, plays all the instruments and does all his recordings are just him with all the, all of everything he records himself. And he's got a whole following on, you know, Spotify and online magazines and playlists and everything that's just, you know, he doesn't have a record label and mm -hmm. it's, he's got his whole community and he's, and does what you do as far as I don't even know if you need record those folks. Labels. And he's yeah, 20 years old, you know, it's good um, for him. Yeah. And so since we've all been here on the farm together, we're all playing every night and we're, we're getting ready to release some family music, which is a total thrill. Um, but, you know, I, I look at, what he's doing and, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm in awe of his musicality and his, the roots that he has musically because, you know, he has all of us. He never had a chance to do or be anything else is the truth in our family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he just picked it up for the time he was born. And, um, but it's really, it's inspiring to see the generations unfold. And, um, and, you know, he's, you know, I'm learning a lot from playing with him. <laughs> Well, it's it speaks a lot to the endurance of the message or the purity of what you were singing about long ago that is still what you're singing about now. And it shows yeah. you that it wasn't just a fad. It was something really true to you. And I just am glad you guys have decided to stay true to your heart and and uh, and, and stick with it. And now here you are in, in continuing to enjoy it. And it's in some ways, it's a celebration of art itself. Just yes. being able to, to continue across the decades and across different time. I was going to say that one of the things, because Mary Gannon um, and I from, you know, from the band both lived on Kauai, came here. Um, we've done all through the years family jams at usually at our house um, where we have sometimes through the years like 50 people in the living room with kids, you know, infants to elders all playing music for, you know, all afternoon, all evening. We've done that our whole lives. And there are so many people who are now, you know, in their 40s, but they were part of the kids that were part of all that, and they're all playing music. And they know what it is to get together and have jams and just, you know, have different people throw in a song and have, you know, have the kids play and have makeup things and all of that, you know, and I think... Ultimately, that's one of the things with our band and our spirit is we love to bring voices together and people together. And there's, as you know, as human beings, we're wired to play and sing and dance together and to actually gather. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that's just something we are always will, you know, raise the flag for and be a stand for um, is, is people playing music together. Really, well, you know, and not, and you don't have to be a musician. You can have a, you know, you can have a pot and a pan and a, you, know, you can have a, a serving spoon and a, and a saucepan and play some percussion, you know? 
I couldn't agree more. It's yeah. it's a human right yes. to be creative and and be musical, whether or not it, this idea that we pay other people to do it yes, for us. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, that we are like consumers of music rather than mm-hmm. we are all makers of music. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We all yeah. can sing as long as we yeah. have a voice. We have voices. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope you guys can we can get through this time to whatever the future holds. It will be one that you can gather as a group again and continue what you're doing for all yeah. of us. There's so much loss in not being able to gather that way, but um, hopefully this is just a break. Yep. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to get us into the history and where you are now. <laughs> so, you know, yes. people check it out. It sounds fun. Thank you so much for your interest. And, you know, it's the, the uh, kind of the magic of this technology allowing us to have this this beautiful online meeting. It's great. I mean, if this virus had happened a long time ago, or it, I mean, another one, other ones did. You know, we mm-hmm. we couldn't gather like this. You know, we didn't have the no. chance to gather virtually, which is which is no. a blessing. And it, yesterday, I was at a Zoom party, a birthday party, with a bunch of the <laughs> yoga community in LA for Dervla Kelly, Dave, Dave Stringer's wife, and just to see everybody's faces. It was like, ah, oh, that was so, feels so good. So mm-hmm. that, that's, it's a blessing to be allowed to gather on some level, you know. There are gifts that come out of it despite the hardships. It's, um, it's a mixture for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Denise. It's been lovely chatting. Thank you, Krishna. Yeah. Thank you so much, Denise, for giving us your time. Check out the Ace of Cups. You can find them where you listen to music. Uh, if you go to their website there's some cool videos too like of them playing back in the late 60s super like psychedelic hazy it's awesome I highly recommend it Uh, I look forward to uh, connecting with them again in the future I hope to see you on the live stream on April 19th that's at 3.30pm Pacific you can find where to watch that or how to watch that at eastforest.org slash tour you can also see how to sign up for that whole ramdas weekend um thanks for bearing with me on the technical side i'm all, i'm all on my own and i'm trying to like restream this simultaneously in multiple places so send me good fortune and and good vibrations um and stay tuned on the may 2nd uh, additional the shamanic east forest ceremony style live stream all right my friends Thank you for giving this podcast a review. If you haven't done it, do it right now. You can do it more than once. Five stars makes a big difference, especially uh, reading the reviews you guys write. That's always fun too. Uh, But we're doing it together. So keep walking your walk. Don't take any shit, but if you do, (laughs) you got to do it with grace. Do it with grace. Grace.